somebody, when I was feeling my worst and been into AA a couple of months or so, and by the way, the spirituality of AA gives you so much freedom to explore your spirituality. It's not centered in dogma. It's basically you develop your own concept of God in the AA world. Sure. And, uh, and you know, what I say to people is I've watched this work now for over three years and people don't come up with a more cruel pathological God. If you let them come up with their own God, <laughs> it's like they, they usually almost come up with a more loving, kind, generous God, you know, yeah. imagine that. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are listening to and or watching my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today I have um, Fred Heron. I was about to say Harmon. Sorry, Fred, um, <laughs> who I, I did a podcast with him on his podcast just the other day. And then we'd had some personal conversations before that. So I'm a little mixed up as to how much I've got to introduce him. But then my producer, Ernie, reminded me that in terms of our podcast here, this is our first time talking. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, before we get into anything. Um, you and I met through a mutual friend. Uh, is that not right? And that was Rod. Rod Colburn. Yeah, Rod That's Colburn in New York. Yes. And he introduced us. And Rod is someone who did an event for a new book of mine a few months ago or a year ago mm -hmm. now. Time flies. Um right on the rooftop where he has events uh, next to his apartment on, um, is he actually on Wall Street? I mean, he's right down there across from the- Yeah, yeah. yeah. I stayed, when I went there in August, I stayed on Wall Street. His, yeah. We just walked around the corner to get to his place, you know, so. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. anyway, we're, we're um, he introduced us and, and now we're talking. So let me introduce you this way. Uh, we've got something that, Ernie wrote down for me here that you're the founding pastor of one of the fastest growing churches in America, which started with four people and grew to over 5,000 parishioners and attendants. Uh, and then you kind of had a, um, you, sorry, my video had a problem. You had a yeah, okay. situation where you left that, uh, that you've described variously as a meltdown or a crisis. Um, this was the vineyard, correct? Yes, yes. I started a vineyard church in Kansas City, Missouri from, from scratch, literally like knocking on doors in yeah. 1990. So, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. and then 29 and that, years. Yeah, that sort of took me back to was it John Wimber? Yes. Who started it all? Yeah, it's and actually, it was actually in the UK. Ken, it was actually a guy named Ken Gullickson in, uh, in America. in los angeles who started the first uh vineyard church right there was a there's a small number of vineyard churches that were started in the late 70s before john wimber got into the vineyard yeah and ken had come out of calvary chapel so this was right. all the early days of the jesus movement in california oh, you know early days of christian worship christian rock and roll all that kind of stuff yeah and we had a guy at Brief fellowship the ministry my parents started called Jack Sparks, who then wound up on the cover of Life magazine, baptizing hippies in swimming pools right. in San Francisco. And then we had people coming out of the vineyard from the UK. And then it seemed, from the point of view of the evangelicals at the time, the sort of more mainstream folks, that the vineyard had kind of become almost cultic, which of course is weird because evangelicalism itself is kind of cultic, as all big churches are. So I guess where I want to start with you is not digging into the reasons for your meltdown and crashing and burning in the per, in, in the in the personal sense but a larger issue and that is uh, and I think you're a great person to answer this um why is it that so many people who come to leadership in big time evangelical religion uh where the big money is and the fame is and the book royalties are and the big speaking circuit is the big churches um it happens so often that someone crashes and burns in that context is either then tossed out or repents and is rehired. Sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's all of the above, sometimes mm -hmm. it's just sheer craziness. But let me start with this. You know, right now as we speak, Elon Musk is sort of, uh, you know, has taken over Twitter. And a lot of people think he's kind of crashing and burning. Someone described it the other day 
as watching the Hindenburg go down in slow motion, um, our tech masters seem to not only have inflated egos, but also seem to either crash and burn or become crazy or so involved with themselves and not listening to other people that what I'm trying to say is it's not only big time evangelical religion that has this phenomena of leadership, uh, burnout at best and at worst criminality. Looking back on your own story, which we will get into in a minute, why don't you take some time and unpack whatever theory you have um, as to why this crash and burn phenomena, this burnout phenomena is not the, the, the exception in the evangelical world, but almost the norm. Uh, if you look at many, many stories of leaders across across the USA and yeah. maybe around the world as well. Have I overstated it? Um, and if, no. if so, how? And if not, can you unpack this for us? Because I think you're you're kind of an insider expert. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't my goal in life, you know. To... Right. <laughs> but um, no, I think I think it's it's different for different individuals. Like I was a really shy kid. Mm. Um, and had a lot of anxiety issues. Then I came to Jesus at a, like as a teenager yeah. and felt called to be a pastor as a, like a 16, 17 year old, and then had to overcome a lot of, uh, fears and insecurities and became, got to the point where I still got nervous every time before I spoke, but, mm. um, the, uh, even, even public speaking for me created anxiety. And even after I'd done it for years in front of big audiences and stuff. Mm. And, and then I think um, pastoring in the helping or, or doing people work, like if you study the helping professions, there's mm. a lot of burnout, you know, it's almost the similar to like early lawyer stage burnout in terms of percentage. Like I, I remember looking at seminary statistics and, uh, people who graduated from seminary within three years, 50% of them are typically out of the ministry. And then if you go to the 10 year mark, 70% are out and it's all different kinds of reasons, but there's a lot of stress when you're, when your job and your world is, is helping people in every single aspect of their life. You're there for crises. You're there for, you know, the happy days, the baby dedications, the weddings, the funerals, the crises, the, divorces, the meltdowns. And then if things start growing and your staff starts growing, all of a sudden, you know, and if, especially if you're an entrepreneur like I was, all of a sudden you're kind of like CEO, COO, CFO. Hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I just like, so I wasn't sleeping. I only slept three or four hours a night and that wouldn't be everybody's story, but I, I just managed that. But I, there was always, there's always conflict to deal with. There's always people crises to deal with. There's always, you know, within an hour, you can have some of the deepest sorrows and some of the greatest joys. And so I think over the course of all of that wear and tear, um, the stress can get to you. And then you start yeah. trying to deal with that stress in either healthy or unhealthy ways. Hmm. And then, um, and then depending on the personality, if, you know, if people are super narcissistic or, or egocentric, you know, then they start getting full of themselves. Hmm. And I, I probably, most of the people, I probably wasn't wired that way. I kind of tried to push other people forwards and, and raise people up. But, but still, as your church grows, even if you tell people, like, if I use myself as a story, it was usually like in a self-deprecating way. I didn't want to make myself the hero of every story. Right. And that, that relates to people, but as your church grows and gets bigger, even, even if you're, even if you're honest about your flaws, it's still like, I tell people I would get nervous and anxious about stuff and um, they wouldn't even believe me because of the way they watched me speak. They didn't yeah. pick it up. So I think it varies from person to person to person based on their personality. Certainly, there's a lot of people who are control freaks, who are narcissistic, who are maybe even <laughs> pathological, who get in the ministry, who get into these big time things. Yeah. So do you think it makes them that way once they're in? Or do you think some I, of these guys, it seems to me that some of them come in, you know, treating this like a con artist would as a criminal enterprise from the beginning and flying under the radar and yeah. using their 501c3 religious status to make a lot of money. And that's their intent. I think others got in 
sort of sin more sincerely and yeah. then the very the very power and money corrupts and 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 you kind of got out on a different way as i understand your story and that you had some personal cataclysms but you yeah. you know i know this will sound weird asking somebody face to face but we know each other well enough so i can say this you didn't get into this as a criminal looking to make a quick buck dishonestly no. No, and, I, and you I, never crashed and burned in the sense of stealing the money or doing anything like that. You had personal issues, but right, you must right. know of people in both the vineyard movement and the wider evangelical mega churches who you probably regard as crooks, who were crooks <laughs> from the beginning, or certainly became crooks, or certainly disingenuous, yeah. or played the nepotism card out to the limit where everybody in the family and your cousins hired and your expense accounting, your right. plane and your house. I mean, talk a little bit about those different kind of categories, because I think yeah. people are fascinated with big time religion. I think so. I think people like I was mostly hanging out with local church pastors. And if there's mm -hmm. let's just say there's 350,000 churches in America, the average size church is 75 people. Right. Like when I started my church, I had 25 people at the end of one year. Yeah. At 50 people at the end of two years. I had 120 at the end of three, you know, and it just grew 10 to 20 percent every year. Yeah. And then, you know, and then by the end of 28 years, you've got several thousand people and, yeah. you know, a multi-million dollar budget. But that was never my goal. Um, I was always trying to help people come to Jesus and always try to get them, you know, connected to small groups and yeah. help them discover their spiritual gifts so they could serve other people. And mm -hmm. I mean, my, my motive was pr pretty clear, but I think, I think that as you succeed, um, you know, the, out of all those 350,000 churches, people don't realize this, but a mega church averages over 2,000 on mm -hmm. the weekend. And out of those hundred, those 350,000 churches, there's only about 2,000 mega churches in America, which is less than 1%. Sure. You know? And so, and I would say that out of the mega church pastors, I knew most of them were, got into it like I did, pretty, pretty clean hearts and that kind of thing. Um, when and if, especially if you stay in the saddle as a local church pastor, um, there's enough to beat you up. Like it's hard to stay in the ministry over the long haul because you get beat up by people all the time. And so if you have a big ego, it's going to get a beating in the local church. It yeah. really does. But I'd say some of these um, parachurch ministries, Frank, yes. that you're uh, that aren't rooted in the local church mm -hmm. that that gather international, national, international audiences really quickly. Yeah. The, the, and a lots of money fairly quickly, the ego surge on that. It's almost like a rock star. And that would, that would also encompass star. the televangelists and people like uh -huh. focus on the family yeah, and, yeah. Dobson you, and all the, you know, all, all these names we know you, so well that, yeah, you can and I think that needs, yeah. And it needs to be pointed out. Those are parachur. They aren't pastor. Yeah. They may have been a pastor, or, right. or something, but the ministry they're running is a completely different kind of animal. Right. It's not a church. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, man, you can get full of yourself and the nepotism stuff. And so I've seen that a lot, right. In yeah. the parachurch world, but the guys, but of course are, the churches feed those parachurch organizations they, because they're raising money from the same flock as it were, except it's a national or international flock. And secondly, mm -hmm. you don't see too many evangelical pastors stand up and denounce the parachurch super ministries and say, don't send them your money, uh, yeah. don't buy their books, don't yeah. send their gifts to their crappy TV show, this guy's a thief or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a kind of a there's a kind yeah. of an unspoken solidarity of like well we're just not going to wash our dirty laundry here because it'll take us all down i really think that's a factor don't you i think yeah i i mean i wouldn't use my my platform to critic to be critical of anybody honestly yeah um i i tried you know if i talked about somebody else outside mm -hmm. my myself or my church i would usually use them in a positive way. I wasn't cutting down Catholics. I wasn't cutting sure. down other denominations. I wasn't, I wasn't even cutting down other religions, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I was talking about loving Muslims about a week or two after nine 11. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, and, that, and you've got to say in terms of the evangelical and conservative churches, that's a little bit, uh, you, you know, you were not. Oh, I was way out on the edge on yeah. that. Right. Because, you know, you had people that were standing up saying, you know, we'd been, you know, God was judging America because of homosexual, homosexuals or, you know, whatever. I was just Yeah. Like, oh, so how God. far do you want to dive into 
your story of how you got out. And really, I don't want to dwell on this, not to not embarrass you, but I think in the end, we all have our stories. And, uh, you know, yeah, no, what was it that got you either tossed or change everything? And then I want to get right. to the real quick, but I don't, I want you to spend a minute on that because people are going to be saying, oh, why do you get kicked out? Who'd he kill? You, right. know, and that, you didn't kill anybody. <laughs> but the thing is, um, but then I want to get to the real question. And so please remind me if if we get tied up in this personal narrative. The real question to me that I'd like to go to next after we figure out how you got kicked, booted or whatever happened is what do you think now in terms of belief? And I'm quite ready to talk about where I'm at. You know, I describe sure. myself as an atheist who believes in God in the sense I right. was raised in a certain way. I still pray, but I don't really believe anymore in the sense that my parents would have defined belief. And I want to get to where you are right now, unequivocally. Yeah. How would you define yourself? Before we do that, how come you're not a pastor of a 5,000 member church right, right now? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was an insomniac for almost 30 years. I slept three or four hours a night, probably sure. on average. Um, I just managed it. I was, I've been a cyclist, so I've been fairly healthy and active my whole life. Yeah. I'm a like, bicyclist. Um, yeah. And I was able to manage it. But when I, when I hit 55, it had kind of caught up to me. Hmm. And um, so I went to a psychiatrist to deal with the sleep issue. He tried me on different things, but then the thing that worked was Xanax. Yeah. And I started taking Xanax every night prescription. It worked like, like a magic pill for nine months. And then it started rapidly declining after every day of use. And yeah. then I started adding shots of vodka in on top of that. Yeah. So it got to where um, I, uh, for over two years, I was doing Xanax and alcohol for yeah. sleep every night. Yeah. just to sleep. That was really my motivation. Um, and I hadn't been, a, you know, ever abused alcohol or drugs prior to that, except for when I was like 14, 15, 16, sure. you know, but at any rate, um, then my marriage had not been super healthy, but I was one of these people who didn't believe in divorce was going to be, you know, faithful to God, faithful to my wife and all sure. that. And I, I was for, you know, our, our marriage ended at the 37 year mark, but I was yeah. faithful you know, a good 35 plus years of that. Sure. Um, and I was a good evangelical kid, Frank, you know, I waited till I got married to have yeah. sex. Oh, you know, so I was, I was into this stuff and wholeheartedly into it. Um, right. And then, uh, and I didn't realize probably how much uh, shame was attached to my sexual ethics. Uh -huh. um, and then how much of that was uh, anyway. So the marriage wasn't super great. So uh, after the Xanax and alcohol, uh, my my wife had ended up moving in with her mother yeah. uh, to take care of her full time. So now I'm home alone. And in 2016, yeah. 17, I got super burned out, but was in a building program and going full blast. And I was in a second doctorate PhD program. So I had a lot going on. I was spinning a lot of plates and sure. I... In the process of taking Xanax and alcohol, my wife moved out of the house. I got the bright idea I wanted to have sex, <laughs> which, by the way, I, you know, in my marriage, we, we had, we had uh, basically been roommates for a long, long time. Yeah. So um, under, without Xanax and alcohol, I always had enough self-discipline to behave myself. But under the influence of Xanax and alcohol for about a year and a half, I ended up so two things that got me into big trouble were I wanted to sleep and I wanted to have sex. Well, there you <laughs> go. Sleep and sex. We'll do it every time. Okay. Yeah, enough so said. Enough said. We okay. can we can we can write the ending to this story ourselves. And yeah. at some point you got tossed or you left or well, I told left you. my I told my board about I thought I needed to detox off Xanax and alcohol. I was the right. first one to confess to my wife about yes. my faithfulness. And they sent me to rehab for 120 days while I was in rehab. Nobody interviewed me. I wound up on the front page of the Kansas City Star Sunday edition, yeah. two page article, my picture above Trump's. And I was an alcoholic, an addict and an adulterer. I call it the triple A. There you go. And, and uh, that'll do it. But there was yeah. no pool boy involved. Yeah. So you and, missed one. There was no right. pool boy. And, exactly. <laughs> you could have done a much better. <laughs> right, right. Scandal. It could have been even more dramatic. But I mean, anyway, that's a pretty low key scandal as scandals go. But there but, you go. So you were out. Yeah. So I. While I was in rehab 120 days, my wife filed for divorce. My board asked for my resignation. I came home to an empty house, empty checking account, and had to put my house up for sale and hire a divorce yeah. lawyer. So yeah. all of that to say, 
in, in, the, in 2019, when I got out of rehab, I literally felt like an atheist. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to get into what I believe now, or, okay. So or, let's, or, let's, or let's, you can ask questions if you want. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward because I think I'm so for, personally, you know, I have forgotten now that we're do, supposed to do a podcast here. So let me reintroduce you. And I'm talking uh, today with someone who was a big time pastor, uh, Fred Heron, and is sort of becoming a friend of mine because he's interviewed me. And we have a mutual friend, and I'm enjoying this conversation so much that I forget to to properly say who you are. But anyway, um, you're listening to or watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which is a podcast, which, by the way, if you like this conversation, please like it in the online sense of helping us by subscribing, liking, doing all the things you do. This will be on various podcast places. It's Facebook Live right now. You can watch it or listen to it again wherever these things happen. Um, so now let me, let me get on now, Fred, to the question that really fascinates me, because this question has two parts to it. One is, um, you're on a lifetime journey as someone who became a Christian in the evangelical sense. You've had big changes in your life. You're no longer a pastor. That ending was abrupt, like a car crash. Um, I am no longer an evangelical and I was in a leadership position on purely a nepotistic ticket. Um, and I've written about that. I'm completely out of that world now. Uh, I no longer see myself as a Christian as defined by evangelicals. Um, I'm a person of faith by habit. I separate the idea of practice, say prayer from actual mm -hmm. belief. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of know my story a little bit and I've written about it and this, this program is not about me. The only reason I'm sharing that is to open the door for you to speak as clearly as you can to where you're at today, which is a matter of interest to me, because I think the spiritual journey um, is a completely different thing from the personal journey, as in you being a pastor and now you're not a pastor, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Yeah. How, 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 where do you see yourself now? Did getting tossed make you rethink everything? Do you still consider yourself to be a Christian in the sense you once were? Are you somewhere else now? And tell us about the steps and where you wound up. Yeah, so I'm I'm still very much in process, but I'll I'll tell you about that process. We're only talking about right now. Yeah, but like this I, at this very minute. Yeah, I can't back up just a just a just a tick. Yeah, you can back up a tick, but we got to get to this minute at okay. some point. And then I totally yeah. agree; it's a journey. And I, you know, literally by the time this podcast is done, you may have moved another place somewhere because we're on a we're on a journey here right i'm not right. i'm not tying you down i'm just yeah that's why i'm saying this minute well, not some other time i would say that i felt like an atheist when i got out of rehab um i i uh everything was shattered i'd lost everything everything had been ripped away you know my career my marriage my my standing in the community yeah uh, all of that stuff and um, and then after my divorce happened in July 2019, I probably drank every day for six weeks straight. I got myself so sick. I finally thought I got to get my shit together. Right. So I actually went to AA, even though I hadn't been a lifelong alcoholic or drug addict or that kind of thing. Yeah. And I decided I'd be super honest mm -hmm. in AA about even about my faith. Right. Cause it was shattered. Like I didn't know what I believed and I'm not sure I'd believed in anything. And I questioned everything and doubted everything and rethought everything. And I've always been a broad reader. Like, so mm -hmm. I, the kind of stuff that you read now, I was, I've always been reading that stuff. So you can imagine all the fuel I had in my brain <laughs> to yeah. challenge everything. You know what I mean? Cause I wasn't ever just reading Christian stuff. I was always mm -hmm. reading everything and including science. I love science. Yeah. And, always believed in old earth. I was never a young earth guy. I was never a creation scientist guy, you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So at any rate, um, somebody, when I was feeling my worst and been into AA a couple of months or so, and by the way, the spirituality of AA gives you so much freedom to explore your spirituality. It's not centered in dogma. It's basically you develop your own concept of God in the AA world. Sure. And, uh, and you know, what I say to people is, I've watched this work now for over three years and people don't come up with a more cruel pathological God. If you let them come up with their own God, <laughs> it's like they, they usually almost come up with a more loving, kind, generous God, you know, yeah. imagine that. Yeah. And so, 
somebody sent me a Richard Rohr book uh, in the fall of 2019. It was called Falling Upward. And I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Rohr. Yes, but, I do. I, I, uh, I, 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 I love, I ended up devouring Richard's books. And yes. I would say he, he got my faith off the ventilator, but it wasn't where it was. I, I, and I'm still in very, very much a big process. So I got into therapy. I got into AA. I started going to a clergy group to called Shepherds Helping Shepherds, which is an interfaith group, it had Buddhist rabbis uh, and mostly progressive type Christians in it. Right. And then I also started uh, into a mindful meditation group, which is more comes out of the Buddhist tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. And those were all the things that I started doing. And I started reading Richard Rohr's footnotes. And so like I, I'm reading Ken Wilbur, I'm reading, you know, I'm reading uh, neuroscientists, you know, I'm, I sure. love brain research, you know, because I'm trying to. So I and that's why I started Spirituality Adventures about a, over a year after I'd been in AA and doing all that kind of stuff. And let me just say to people who are listening to this, you don't have to try to remember any of this spiritual the taglines because we're going to put links to whatever you want to be linked to so people can yeah. link to you or and it's called say it again spirituality adventures yes more of an adventure than you bargained for right more, exactly. an, more of an adventure than you bargained for but in any case yeah. i don't want to interrupt you but just let people know we will link to all that so they can be in touch with you but also see what you're yeah. doing right now okay so yeah. the story continues so, yeah so i I just started reading everything, rethinking everything yeah. and was reading super broadly, um, going to meditation group every week, you know, diving into that. Like I'm so like, right. Currently I'm doing some meditation training with uh, Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock. They're yeah. two really uh, well-known uh, people in that space in America. I'm going to interrupt you a second and bring you back to this. We're going to continue the journey, but I've got to ask you a question. Yeah. Which, um, at this point in your journey, which is not this minute right now that we got to before, which you'll still bring me to. And if it's in flux and you can't say, that's fine, because that's a place too. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm in a place, you know, but I have to say this, I sometimes wonder this about myself, and I'm wondering it about you. Um, let's say you had not been a pastor. Let's say mm -hmm. you had never, never, quote unquote, come to Christ. Let's say religion had never been part of your life. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you had become an alcoholic and gone to AA, and that was your introduction to some idea of divinity as in a therapeutic use to get you off alcohol, but maybe there's really mm -hmm. something there, but that was it. Would you still be interested in, re quote unquote, rekindling your faith by reaching, re reading Richard Rohr or whatever it may be, or are you like me in the sense that I have to admit the reason I pray in the morning is I was brought up that way and it's part of my life and I would miss it. And it has nothing to do with belief. And I've separated practice from yeah. theology or apologetics or philosophy. Right. You know, it's like who, who yeah. you are. And I'm wondering that about you because I was brought up with this idea that we sort of believe in something that's objectively true and it's not personal. It actually all mm -hmm. happened in time yeah. and space. There was a resurrection. All this was true. Christianity mm -hmm. makes sense. There's a reason to believe that legacy for me um, explains why I'm still interested in spirituality. Yeah, you bet. And I need it, but it isn't, I didn't start from zero and became this. Right. So if you had been from a totally different background, would you be doing any of this stuff? Are you actually yeah. interested in it in it in and of itself? Or are you just doing this because you feel bad having left whatever you were doing and now you're looking for the next thing? What is it? Yeah, I actually, so I actually... When I got out of rehab, I had a friend, Missouri was voting on medical marijuana. And mm -hmm. I had a friend who uh, was, you know, trying to get licenses for that. I actually helped him raise money for a medical marijuana company, trying to get away as far as I could from the pastor hat. And then I ended sure. up becoming the weed pastor because everybody found out I was a pastor. And yeah. uh, it was just hilarious. But I think I was totally into science and mathematics and really good at it. And I probably would have pursued that kind of field. And I've always been fascinated with the universe and its its majesty and how old it is. And so mm -hmm. I think I would have probably gone down the uh, the science route if I hadn't been yes. called to be a doctor. And then if I had to become an alcoholic scientist and come to AA, I have friends like that. I hang out with these kind of people all the sure. time. And not all of them, 
all of them develop some kind of spirituality because they have to admit that they're powerless yes. and life is unmanageable. And so they come yeah. up with some kind of man. But like, I have a friend who's a doctor right now who didn't grow up like you and I, mm. and his, he loved native American uh, religion and his, his God he adopted is more like the great spirit, you know, kind of more akin to native American mm. stuff. Um, I have friends that are more Buddhist. Now I have sick friends, you know, yeah. the Sikh uh, thing. I, and it's really fast. It's been fascinating. And I have people, I do groups now that are just spiritual support groups with meditation. And so I have people all over the spiritual map. I have people who don't have yeah. religious backgrounds and all of them or, come or, up or might be part of that group that says nuns, N O N E. Yeah. You know, they don't have be anything, but I have a question there. And that is, yeah. you know, if you went to the apologetics of someone like my father or other evangelical theologians, they would say this need for spirituality reflects the truth of what's really out there, that we are created in the image of God. We have this empty mm -hmm. place. We're reaching out. It strikes me as odd though, because we have less people going to church. And yet, if you look at the statistics of the number of people who are going to tarot card readers or seers of some sort, you yeah. know, witchcraft, all this, this is probably the most superstitious group of younger people there's ever been. They may not be religious right. and right. they're not, and it's not just spirit, spirituality. I mean, they're doing stuff that yeah. whole generations of Western, you know, interactions right. would have dis disregarded as absurd. I mean, yeah. really going back into the into the into the superstitions that are, you know, all people of science or enlightenment reject mm -hmm. wholesale. Yeah. But are you part of that? Because you're fishing around in all this spirituality, unrooted. And me, you know, am I part of that? Because I pray and I feel this need. I just think it's a very odd period of history when it comes to transitioning from organized yeah. religion to some form of spirituality and being more right. comfortable with that. And at the same time, not questioning all of it. I mean, the new mm -hmm. atheist movement, say, represented by people like uh, Bill Maher, you know, on his program, yeah. Religious, right. he would be laughing in our face saying, well, you guys are just totally wasting your time talking about this. Right. I mean, this right. is, you know, we settled this in the enlightenment. What, what the hell are yeah. you talking about? Right. I understand. Yeah. And I listen to those kind of people too. So, but I, I would still, um, you know, I would still call myself a Jesus follower. I, I couldn't get away from Jesus entire, you know, and then I would say that I define spirituality as connection with self, others, and something greater than you. Hmm. So that's a pretty broad uh, definition of spirituality, but it's, it doesn't have to be rooted in dogma or a certain faith or religious tradition. Yeah. I think that everybody, you know, I think just healing and mental health and therapy is a, is to me, it's a spiritual journey, even that side of it. Um, yes. uh, and then, then people do wonder, you know, if you look at the number of people who pray in America, like the person, it's like 95% of America. But is that because we who pray think there's actually a God listening to us? And do we expect answers? Or are we just superstitious enough to once we get the parking spot we were praying for, and it works so, out, we're saying, there you are, we, I got answered, there must be a God. I don't want to be that flippant, but it almost is there in terms of triviality now. But like you, I pray, I train myself to pray every day, all day long, hours in prayer. You know, I pray, 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 pray. So even when I was feeling like an atheist, I'm talking, I'm, I'm walking around my house talking to myself that there's no God. You no, know? I still do it. I still do it. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm I, like, and so, you know, no if God, people are, I, if people are, yeah, but I mean, people listening to this podcast are going to be saying, well, what's Frank Schaefer really after? What I'm, what's he trying to pull, push poor Fred to say here? I'm not, <laughs> I'm talking to myself here. I mean, yeah. you're just a mirror of my own discussion with myself. Yeah. I'm like, so I've when, been I, walking when I ask around you what's going on, I'm asking talking myself, to myself my on. whole life if there's no God, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but I, I still do it. I was doing it even in my darkest moments. Um, yeah. like I was like going, you know, but yeah. And like, so, and I liked what you said when I interviewed you, you said, it's kind of like your relationship to your wife. Sure. There's some days when loving your wife means you hate her less, which just yeah. sounds really atrocious. Well, we were trying to define belief, and I was yeah. saying, hey, why, why make this different than any other part of life? Yeah. You know, we and never would... define love that way. Love is love can be hating someone less, and then you reconcile, or love yeah. can be very romantic and beautiful, but love can mean a lot of things, and I think faith yeah. is the same. Yeah, I've had days when I was just virtually, like, if there's a God, like, F you, God, yes, you know? Right. Right. And then there's been other days when, you know, I'm supple and tender and crying out in the ways I always did, you know? And yeah. so I found when you said that, and that sense of some days I'm more a believer and some days I'm more of an atheist. Right. 
you know, if you read my personal journal, you would see that in almost every week of journaling for the last yeah. three and a half years. Yeah. Now, I'd still say I'm a Jesus follower, um, but I'm, you know, I'm rethinking, I've rethought everything, and I've really come to believe in the science behind meditation. Mm. And I think, and like you, you know, even if Jesus isn't, you know, who who Orthodox Christianity has said that he's fully God, fully man, and he's the third person of the Trinity, you know, or the second person of the Trinity, you know, that kind of thing. He still was on to something about love, right? This evolutionary trajectory, as you put it, that yeah. um, is almost like he was ahead of his time. Like, yeah, and you and I talked about this on your yeah. podcast, and they're sort of becoming one and the same. But I, I, and I, and I think I made this point because I've written about it. But then we had a good discussion, so I'm going to make it again here in case yeah. that opens some doors for you. You know, my view of the the quote unquote teaching of Jesus is two things. First of all, we don't have the teaching of Jesus; we have what other people wrote about him. But let's for the sake of the argument, say Jesus said this or that or whatever. We don't really know. A lot of this was written down later. Let's put it this way. Worst case scenario, somebody made up some nice stuff, but it still resonates because, and this was the point I was making when we were talking, it happens that when you study um, evolution in terms of where modern science is, it's no longer about the survival of the fittest, right. which is a kind of a white male patriarchal construct of why we have sharp elbows and push to get ahead. It, it's all about the, it, the survival mm -hmm. of the friendliest. It's about cooperation. And I think the reason the teaching of Jesus resonates has nothing to do with him being God or not being God, um, or particularly holy or anything else. It has to do with the fact that ahead of his time, mm -hmm. um, Jesus basically articulated our deepest, uh, our deepest knowledge that we have about our own survival that comes from evolution, which is community, mm -hmm. cooperation, fairness, sharing, and love. Neither of us would be here talking today if someone in our past ancestry that we are never going to even know existed had not fed and clothed and cared for us at great personal cost to themselves, maybe their own life. That's that's how we roll. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just that it takes a village. It takes an entire ancestry or none of us get here. Right. And that involves right. sacrifice and altruism and all the things Jesus taught. Um, so I think his teachings resonate uniquely because they uniquely reflect the actual truth that evolution has taught us as a species of how to survive and yeah. i think that's why they do that's a different discussion but right so i think you can follow jesus and not believe any of the theology about who jesus was but simply say look yeah. this resonates because without this type of behavior we're all dead we're all gone right. yeah and even some of my rabbi friends who wouldn't endorse the christian view of jesus mm -hmm. still find great value in jesus as a rabbi you know right. as his teachings right and my muslim i have muslim friends that call themselves muslim followers of jesus i have yes. hindu friends call themselves hindu follower of jesus they, yes. because they've come to value his teaching even though they're from a different faith yeah. tradition yeah i would say my concept of god the the people so i was reading it when i went to baylor people don't realize this because baylor's a southern baptist institution but it was very liberal in the early 80s when sure. i went there and you know my professors were into tillich and schleimacher and bultmann and and yeah. uh, they didn't believe in a literal resurrection and all these kind of things i had been like saved as a teenager and i was like i'm pretty sure i was i i got saved and stopped doing drugs and and then you know, and then if there's demons, I think I may have had them one or two of them. You know what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, so I actually gravitated toward really conservative, but really intellectual, uh, like guys like N.T. Wright and stuff like that. Sure. Now, but as an 18 year old, I was reading process theologians like Charles Hartshorn and uh, Whitehead. Yeah. And now I'm revisiting those guys because they they do such a great job of combining a concept uh what you might call a, you know, a, a concept of God that could work with all the science and evolution that we understand today, coupled up with all the best of psychology and neuroscience of the brain stuff that we have today. But listening to you talk, I would come back and just say, hey, listen, this, this guy sounds like, Fred sounds like he is still haunted by trying to make all this work somehow, even if he has to reach way outside the evangelical tradition to people who, folks like my dad, speaking of Baylor, who went around in the yeah. 1980s trying right. to get Baylor professors fired <laughs> yeah. because they were such heretics. Right. My own family. 
And, right. and well, he was very successful at doing that, by the way. Uh, several, several Southern Baptist seminaries, people lost their jobs because my dad was ganging up on them with other people who were yeah. more conservative. So I've seen that fight. But I, yeah. I would just say to you, if I check in with you in 10 years, and, and let's hope we're both still kicking here and can talk about this, are you going to be looking back and say, wow, I was in transition I'm totally done with that now. I haven't cracked a book by anybody, even people like Richard Rohr that I like for a decade yeah. now. I'm finished with that because that's where I'm at. So yeah, our, I, our friend yeah. our friend Rod sends me Richard Rohr's daily meditation. Yeah, yeah. And I love Richard and I've met him and he's a good guy. But right. but I would I know this is going to sound awful, but I would prefer to just read almost any decent newspaper any morning because for me, reality. Uh, of how it's reported by people yeah. without a spin. Does that mean I'm less spiritual? No, because I'm still praying morning, noon, and night for my grandchildren and all. Right. But I'm not looking for the magic voice that'll make it all make sense yeah. to me. I'm not yeah. even looking. In other words, I, I I am past thinking that if I just read 10 more books, I'm going to have a greater understanding yeah. of what now I understand is paradoxical to the point where I think a lot of theologians, and I won't name any names, but everybody has basically wasted their life. Period. Yeah. And that would include my dad's work on apologetics. Some of the people you've mentioned, poor yeah. guys, you know, these are like monks in the, in the 12th century writing long manuscripts about how to identify witchcraft. I'm sorry, right. guys, there were no witches then. There are none now. Yeah. This, you're just, this is just bullshit. So yeah. I look at you and I say, look, this guy's in transition. He's, he's a smart person. He's, he's authentic. He's lovely. I trust him as a human being, but surely you feel at some point, you know, you're not going to get 70, which is my age now, and still be <laughs> fishing around in the in the detritus of liberal and or non-liberal theologians or spiritual or less spiritual. Surely you're going to come to a place where you just say, shit, I wasted a lot of time. There's more out there than this. What am I still doing in this, in this, in this? I time? don't know. I'm not sure, Frank. I I've thought, you know, thought back on my life. And I'm like, you know, since I was 16, I've really, really been about trying to, you know, I, I love, if there's a God, I love God. And I've, I really have a heart for people. Um, I still have a pastor's heart and I still would love to know God. If there's a God, you know what I, I mean? feel the same way. I just and don't think he's in the books, whether it's any people you've mentioned, Francis Schaefer included. That their I, writing may be great, and that would. I've spent my. Me. I love to learn. See, so I literally, I've learned. I've earned a degree every decade of my life. If I hadn't gone to rehab, I would have gotten a PhD in the Hebrew Bible. And I had a. My P, question to a, you is: Is do you think by reading theologians, even meditative, lovely ones, you're actually getting any closer to knowing God than you would simply standing as I do every day when I go out to pee off my front deck <laughs> with my dog? He pees over here. I pee over here. And I'm looking at the sky every day, whether it's well, cloudy or beautiful and clear. And I feel much closer to God at that moment than yeah. I do reading some damn book by somebody who knows as little as I do, finally, about invisibilities yeah. that simply cannot be described. Well, I love nature. I've been a rock climber and backpacker and a mountaineer my whole life um, since I was a teenager. So I get the connection with nature and spirituality. I love that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel more connected there than anywhere, but I do love to read and think and study and learn. And I don't think I'll ever stop that. I, it's just a part of who I am. Hey, I enjoy going and, to churches. I was just in Italy and I yeah. watched a wonderful baptism in the cathedral in Verona. I was deeply moved. I loved it. I love church. I yeah. like everything about it. I take the holy water and make my cross as an, you know, I'm crazy. Yeah. OK, but what I yeah. don't do is then go read a Catholic theology book thinking that will help explain it. Yeah, but I, I, I regard it as an illogical thing I'm doing and yeah. nevertheless valid. But I don't think it can be explained by parsing more theology. I get, I get what you're saying. But, you know, I still love to learn. Like I just was in Ethiopia, as you know, and I I read a whole history book on the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I just I just enjoyed it. I don't know that I agree with any or I don't know. I that totally I agree. agree. I, I hear that. I, I, I do a lot of reading on other on all sorts of ideas. Yeah. Here's what I'm here's oh, what I'm driving at. I'm saying, are you look reading that thinking, gee, um, you know, if their theology seems more together enough, I may just convert to this. In other words, I'm reading as a historian or I'm reading as an, someone interested in art history. 
I'm not reading from the point of view of it nurturing my sense yeah. of belief. I'm reading for information. That's fine. Read all the theology you want. But do you think that some wise man or woman writing about God is going to take you to a greater understanding? That's all yeah. I'm saying. I don't know. I, I love getting insights from all kinds of people, all kinds of places in nature that, that resonate with me and my heart and my journey. So in that sense, I, I love to read and study and learn. And if it resonates, it resonates. I, I went back and revisited Job. I translated Job out of the Hebrew Bible, most of it. You know, it's funny because Job's a classic where he, that what's on trial is God's justice mm -hmm. in the, in the face of injustice, you know, in the face of all the hideous things that go on in this world, right? And in the end, God's justice is not defended. What it ends in, if, especially if you look at the poetry of the Hebrew, it's paradox and mystery. And and you've and, written about grief and gratitude and suffering, which is, I guess, a segue from what you're talking about. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very, like, my new Fred is less certain, more open. And I'm, and I'm trying to learn how to embrace paradox, mystery, uncertainty, unknowing, and just yeah. good questions, just better questions and live with the questions, not necessarily have to try to nail it all down. Right. But yeah. I've spent my life trying to nail it all down. So I I'm 61. I don't think that's, gonna, <laughs> I think I'm going to always be reading and learning and studying, but I'm just, I like reading open. and learning and studying. I just wonder about way less open. Someone will, yeah. I don't know if I'll ever get to a place where I just like, like, I know you, you, you thought all of that religious stuff would leave you eventually, right? Mm -hmm. All of those religious wirings that you had as a kid, you thought you could rewire your brain and leave all of that. But our brains, like, just as we learn a language, English, mm -hmm. we also learn a mythology, religion. And it, when we learn it as kids, you know, these myths wire, our, our brains are storytellers, right? We have mm -hmm. to make up stories to make up to make sense of the information that's flowing into our brain as young kids. And so the, the mythological languages that were taught, just like, just like English that I was taught mm. shape us. And we, we never really get away from like those things. Right. Even if you, even if you say I'm an atheist, you probably still, if you were raised a Christian, you probably still think in metaphors that came to you as a kid. Right. Sure. And so you might not hold them as as whatever, but they still influence the way you think, the way you process things, yeah, the way you absolutely. view things. You can't really ever get away from that. And I think even if you try to raise your kids, like let's say if, if I was an atheist and married an atheist and we tried to raise our kid in, in that world, hmm. there's still the big questions that humans try to wrestle and answer with that we've always tried to wrestle and answer with. Yes. I think I find, most I find the truth of what you're saying is confirmed when my grandchildren that I do childcare for ask me questions about origins and death and 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 life, I had you know one, one the other one the other day that I actually wrote down on a note that was just too priceless. Jack, who is now eleven, and Nora, who's now eight, when they were a little younger, Jack I think was um, you know maybe eight when this happened, and Nora was six, and Jack asked me over the after school snack will the universe ever end and before i could answer nora with her mouth full of after school snack pipes up from the other end of the table it'll end when god dies <laughs> so don't tell me that i'm raising secular grandchildren right that was right there in her and yeah. i'd never i mean who who it takes a child to even come up with something like that right it not it's not me so I, I would, you know, in this I would, discussion with, that I'm having with you, you know, we're both, Ernie, my producer, sent me a little note saying he's describing us both here as sort of less certain and more open. I think that's right. And of yeah. course, it gets back into what you were talking about in the pieces you've written on grief, gratitude, and suffering mm -hmm. that folks go through during the holidays and the toxic, yep. what you call toxic positivity. Yeah. I, I guess it's that toxic positivity I'm zeroing in on in this discussion. And believe me, as a guy who's written a book called Why I'm an Atheist to Be with God, another one called Patience with God, ha, Crazy for God. Have I gotten this out of my system? No. So right. everything I'm challenging you on, I haven't done. Okay. Right. So um <laughs> and as Nora, as Nora would say, she told me the other day, she said, You knew you're a complete hypocrite. And she always is getting me <laughs> that. And she's eight years old. And then yesterday she said to me, you know. 
um, <laughs> I no longer regard you, she used that word, regard you as an authority figure. And I said, yeah. you don't. And she said, why? Because she says, I think of you as a friend, which is a nice yeah. compliment. But that said, my own interaction with these grandchildren, um, I never give them a straight atheist answer on anything. I'm always leaving yeah. the door open to something. So I'm, you know, I'm not practicing what I preach at all. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, I can't manage to do any of this logical stuff. Yeah. Me, I'm talking about, and I'm just, you know, and I'm just trying to find out if there's anybody out there like you who's made a better job of it, because I haven't. Well, you know, another interesting thing, like when I was feeling the most like an atheist and I was going to AA meetings, I would sit yeah. in these circles of human beings, of, of all types of human beings yeah. who had yeah. all been broken by addiction or alcoholism. Yeah. And they, they came from all different backgrounds, both religiously and economically and even culturally, that kind of thing. But when human beings sit in a circle and get really vulnerable and honest and share their, they share their humanity yeah. at its most vulnerable place, honestly, there's something magical that happens mm. in that space. It's like, call it, I don't even what to call it. It's the spirit moves, magic moves, whatever moves, something happens in that circle of vulnerability and honesty at our at our most vulnerable you know weak places i guess is that kind of the opposite of what you talk about when you talk about toxic positivity yeah oh yeah i i'd say i i'd try to root my spirituality in honesty vulnerability and and a good understanding of, of just humility like mm -hmm. because even even when we approach science we need to have humility right because yeah. uh, you know the best scientists know that we still don't even really understand gravity. You know? I mean, we still don't really understand the laws of physics. Is there only four laws of physics or are there five? You know, I mean, like there's all of these questions, even, even with the hard sciences that we just don't know. And I think, so I think when it comes to human interaction, love, honesty, and vulnerability, and look, we can stand up and brag about our successes all day long, but if I open, I, I spoke to a group of businessmen through the National Prayer Breakfast a year ago, hmm. and I just led with my most embarrassing, most, I just led with my meltdown. And the right. whole weekend changed. Yes. Guys yes. got me off in the corner and started sharing their, sure. their hurts, their pain, their failures, their this, their that. And it was beautiful, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there's something that opens the door to the human heart when we put away all the bullshit, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the pretense and just get real and honest and vulnerable with each other. And it, mm -hmm. it's something beautiful happens there. And I've watched that. And, and uh, I, I love the spirituality of, of honesty, vulnerability, and humility. It's really something I'm trying to walk in the rest of my life. And you know, like for my, say, my cynicism says, when I talk that way to people, and so forth and so on. The way I was raised was always, this is to soften them up to final, to get them to accept your, not you personally here or me, but you know, the way I was raised is that every conversation on an airplane with someone, you know, anytime you, you know, you have a responsibility to bring them to Christ. And so you were right. doing all this vulnerability stuff, but it was not seen in and of itself as important any more than art was. Art was important to open spiritual doors so you could then deliver the message and make yeah. the sale. Yeah. And it was always about the end product being chalk another saved person saved so they won't right. go to hell and we have more people. How right. do you see that now in terms yeah. of these techniques of communication, which I know as an evangelical pastor at some point you were using for some greater end than simply in themselves? How do you see that? Yeah, I was I always had a heart to see people come to Jesus. And right. I, you know, I I would have in the evangelical language, I would have led thousands of people to Jesus or baptize thousands of people and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's people, I still live in the same area. So I bump into people all the time. that are thankful that, you know, they heard me preach, teach, lead them, you know, do all that stuff. And, and so how do you deal with someone thanking you for leading them to a faith that you no longer embrace in the way you did when you led them to it? Cause I run into the same thing. Yeah, I no, I'm them, still, yeah, I'm still thankful if it helped, if it feels like it helped them be better husbands, better wives, better this, better that. And, what happens and if it made them, made them faithful 
white nationalist Trump voters who yeah, are now denying the election so and saying that God <laughs> ordained he to be president. Thank you for bringing me to Jesus. So I knew that I should vote no. for Donald Trump and question the I'm last not, election result. I'm not so happy about that one. Okay. Yeah, no, that would be a, a disappointment. Yeah, because you and me help build an army that the best, you know, if 70% of them really believe that the 2020 election was stolen, part of it's your fault and my fault, because we were part of that movement. And whatever we gave them was not a grasp of empirical reality and truth, because they are very subject to everything from QAnon to conspiracy theories of all kinds. And that that is the group we came from and we helped build. Yeah, and I've heard you talk, obviously, a lot about this. I So I wasn't a very political pastor, although I had a really strong... Hey, it's ability. still your fault, Fred. Yeah, I know. I understand. <laughs> I'll take credit. Um, but we had a real strong social justice platform yeah. that we worked not through politics, but through like serving the city. So we talked about showing God's love in practical ways, no strings attached. Mm. And we really did. We served at all of the, you know, the immigrants, the refugees, the poor, the, I mean, you name it, the sex workers, all this stuff. We really did that and touched mm -hmm. lots and lots of people in our city. And we weren't, and, and we weren't trust even with our public schools that we weren't trying to convert everybody, right? But we it were still just brings up a point that, that this leads to something that I want you to address before we wrap this up, because this is really troubling to me because, you know, I, I, I wish the best for the United States of America. I live here, so do my children and grandchildren. What is it about the evangelical movement that included so much social conscience and so much empathy and kindness and so much hospital building and NGOs feeding people and Billy Graham in 1952 desegregating his events before other people did? So much good. Yeah. What, what happened to us? Yeah. Let's just take for a moment that you did everything right and everything was fine. Some of those people have peeled off and become Trump voters. What, just in all seriousness here, yeah, exactly. we both know that it's a tragedy, that these were not right. all bad people. What happened? Yeah, yeah and I, I'm i like you, like I, I, I don't know if you still feel this way, but I heard you say one time that you, you were shocked at the way it's turned out. Mm -hmm. And I am too, like I... Yeah. Like I would tell people today that Trump turned me into a Democrat. And yeah. I've, I've told my parents that <laughs> my, my mom and dad are still, you know, they'll be listening to this and I love them to death. But, um, you know, I, I didn't see it turning this mm -hmm. way. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the, it, then it's caused me to rethink like the, the white evangelical church right. in America getting behind Trump like they have. It's been super disconcerting to me. Like, I'm like, holy crap, you know, what the hell? Like, well, this makes is me say, well, who were we? You know, I've like told my dad, like, if I acted like Donald Trump, dad, I would have gotten a spanking, you know? And right. uh, my dad worked for TWA and Carl Icahn was the guy that destroyed the company. And there's sure. a restaurant here that we go to that has a Carl Icahn picture with a dart on his head. And I always try to remind my pictures like, like that's, that's Donald Trump. But in, you know, Donald's even probably, you know, anyway, I, Makes, so, it makes Enron I, look good. Makes Enron look good. Yeah, but but I don't, so I didn't, I had a very mix, like I had Republicans and Democrats in my church. Mm. And I I didn't, I, you know, you could have been a, 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 a strong, I had on my board, I had Democrats on my board, I had Democrats on my staff. Yeah, but I, I, had, I just said, interrupt you a second for people listening, they're going to think this is news. When we went out with our seminars across the country for how should we then live, there were a lot of people when we came with our pro-life message who were leaders in evangelicalism, including, including Dr. Criswell, president of the Southern Baptist Convention at the time, super conservative guy, and Reverend Billy Graham, who were pro-choice, and, yeah. and lots of Republicans uh, were pro-choice. But not only that, there were a lot of Republicans who voted consistently for the Democratic Party. Right. And I'm not talking about Southern Democrat racists. Yeah. I mean, people like, you know, Ron Sider and Jim Wallace and all these other guys. They were evangelicals, yeah. but they were on the right. left. N now right. we right. have this assumption exactly. that somehow it's all from the right. It wasn't. Yeah. I was reading what Sojourners happened? and Jim I'm Wallace what happened. Why? in the 80s. And so I'm, it's a puzzle to me. Um, I think that, uh, man, it's such a puzzle. It's so disheartening, honestly. I think that 
evangelical as a term in America has changed in its meanings over the last 40 or 50 years. I think in the early days, it would have been somebody who you know, was a Jesus follower, wanted to lead people to Jesus and had a conservative view of scripture. Yeah. And, but it really was about Jesus. Okay. But then now if you poll people on evangelical in America today, it's about sure. Trump. Yes. Absolutely. It's not about Jesus. It's about yeah. Trump. Yeah. And so I think that somehow Trump's personality took the 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 people who were marginal white Christians who didn't even go to church. Right. And have somehow they now call themselves evangelical because they're Trump supporters. Yeah. And and you're looking at that and you're like going, well, this isn't anything like Jesus. It's like the opposite of Jesus. Yeah. And yet it's taken over. Um evangelical doesn't mean what it meant when I first started out, Same nor, here. When, nor does it mean what it meant when you started out, Same right? Here. Same here. So it's not really about Jesus anymore. It's about Trump. Yeah. Everything so, I mean, the place that's interesting is that you have conservative evangelicalism that was known for defending a correct view of scripture. And actually, this current generation that we're describing, where it's about Trump, to use the old language with no hyperbole and no irony intended, these are genuinely bona fide by any standard. These are heretics. They are no longer subscribing to the Christian faith as it was defined in my youth and as you received it as someone who came to Christ. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. This is a heretical cultic movement. It doesn't look anything like Jesus. Christianity. What's that? It doesn't look anything like Jesus, I think. No, I mean, if that's a definition of Christianity, to look like Jesus and, you know, armed with an AR, and you know, open carry yep. and and protesting in front of your state house with fully loaded weapons. This is not this like, is not what Billy Graham was doing. Well, it's not what Jesus was about. Jesus no. was a pacifist, you know, love your enemies, you know, nonviolent, civil disobedience. You know, it's just crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So yeah. I think um I think Trump has fueled, you know, white nationalism and adopt and because he adopted the pro-life stance and so many evangelicals you know i wouldn't want to criminalize abortion but i i would still i still identified with you know the idea that life is sacred at all points i don't own a gun frank i but you know, i grew up in missouri where all of my friends hunted you know yeah you know we have hunters around here they you know um but it's just been a weird conflation of i think christian white nationalism yeah. on board with trump who now think that's evangelical yeah, exactly. And, and and guess what? So does the secular big time media who have all, who have bought into this new version of it, insufficiently challenging the idea that these aren't really evangelicals at all, that it's changed to a point where you have to come up with another name, either white nationalism or Christian nationalism, right? Christo fascism, whatever. But it's certainly yeah. not evangelicalism as we right. know. We're going to sign off here in a second. Yeah. But I just want to say yeah. uh, this is in conversation with Frank Schaefer. I am Frank Schaefer. I'm a writer and so forth and so forth. And I am talking today with my friend, Fred Heron. Um, never did tell me where he was this minute, but we got close. <laughs> well, I don't know I could pin it down, Frank. <laughs> no, I was sort of a little bit, a bit, little bit being facetious, but sort of, sort of serious too. Um, this has been a, a really good conversation. And I mentioned before, for those of you uh, who want to get in touch uh, with Fred or follow what he's doing, we are going to be posting the link to, and give me the name again. Spiritualityadventures.com is the website. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 and that's not a travel company, right? That's like yeah. not a cruise line. Not yet. I love, adventures. You, I love hey, spirituality. So, you know, listen, if you follow the evangelical mega church, parachurch organization, I expect you to have a cruise ship on spirituality adventures <laughs> by the time you're done. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, yeah, please get in touch with Fred. He has many good things to say and interesting things. And thank you for the conversation. And also just, um, you know, pushing back a little here because you're, you're, you know, the things you've been wrestling with and the things I've been wrestling with are very much in parallel. So I've really enjoyed this. Mm. And thank me well, for yeah. having you on uh, me on your podcast. By the way, um, if people want to watch you interviewing me and see how much more polite and kind you are and- <laughs> that you interrupt less. Um, where do they go to get, look at that, at that website? It's called Spirituality Adventures on, you know, Apple, Spotify. It's, you know, we shoot it out everywhere. It's Spirituality Adventures on YouTube. 
Good. So, so they can find our interview there. Yep. Yep. It's post. It just posted yesterday. Okay. Interview. Well, it'll be up by the time this gets out, and uh, our our lovely producer Ernie will see ours are up and running too. And hopefully we can cross pollinate a little bit. I'd love yep. to keep talking with you at another time and um, yeah. pursue this because uh, you know a lot and we we track together, I think, very, yeah. very well. We had a good I'll be conversation. I just interviewed Joel Barrett this week, and I think you've interviewed him, Godly but gay. I'll be interviewing yeah. Doug Paget in a couple of weeks. So we have you we, talked to my friend Brian McLaren? Brian and I have been, you know, connected now for a year and I good. I did interview of him on his new book do i stay right. christian so yeah excellent yeah by the way someone you want to talk to and i interviewed her so i'll give her a little plug here is um the making of biblical womanhood by beth allison barr oh interesting she's an oh. interesting lady and i really yeah. like that she's a smart I, woman she teaches and she's her. yeah isn't she yeah. somewhere doesn't she teach somewhere isn't she in baylor no maybe not i don't know but anyway you and her would have a lot to talk about yeah, I I've, I heard an interview that somebody did with her. I think she does teach at Baylor too. Yeah. Yeah. So she was, talk about I, digression here. I'm now plugging yeah. someone else's book, talking about other people's interviews, and we're just petering into nothing here at the end okay. of our talk. But much love to you, and we will yeah. do this again. Thank soon. you so much. Appreciate My it. pleasure. Yeah, right. and I'm really I'm really fond of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You're great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate okay, it. All right. Bye.